What's happening to the world's fourth largest economy? In contrast to other large industrial nations and compared to Europe, Germany's economy is weakening. Companies are complaining about a poor business environment due to high energy prices. There is already talk of creeping deindustrialization, and some economists and politicians believe Germany is once again the so called sick man of Europe. At the same time, right wing populist attitudes are on the rise, and more people are critical of democratic principles. Are prosperity and democracy in danger? On To the Point, we ask a great power in trouble. What's wrong with Germany? Hello and a very warm welcome to this week's To The Point. I'm Javier Arguedas and I'm happy to introduce this week's guests. Anne Delfs is a government reporter for Bloomberg News based here in Berlin. Valerie Höhne is a journalist and editor at the Berlin Bureau of the German newspaper Tagesspiegel. And Katja Hoya is a researcher at the King's College in London and author of the best-selling book Beyond the Wall about the former German Democratic Republic. To all of you, a very warm welcome as well, and thank you for being with us. Uh, Valerie, I'd like to start with you. Most of our viewers are not in Germany and might be wondering why we're even having this discussion. How would you describe this sensation, this feeling in Germany that things are not going well? I feel like um, when the war started, the R Russia Ukraine war started on February 24th, um, 2022, basically, Germany was right at the center almost immediately because of the energy crisis that followed. Germany was heavily dependent on Russian gas and um, that sort of became the country's defining moment of like a downward spiral that we're watching right now unfold. And I think that basically made the country so aware of its vulnerabilities that weren't quite as visible before visible in the country itself, but what about outside of the country? Katja, you live in London, you work in London. Do you think people there also see Germany as a struggling country right now? I think so. I mean, uh, there is a tendency here, I think, to compare Britain to Germany, uh, particularly post-Brexit, um, where people are always looking for figures to show, you know, that it either worked or didn't work, and, and Germany is usually used as the, as the yardstick. Um, and I think at the moment in particular, you know, growth figures are right at the center of this debate. And, and the argument is that the uh, UK economy is, has grown faster um, than that of Germany. And so that that's certainly a, a sense that, you know, Germany is declining whilst Britain is sort of doing OK. Um, or at least that's the, um, the message that the, the, the government and the official figures um, tell. The figures are important. We're going to take a closer look uh, at them later on. Anna, however, you know, not too long ago, under Angela Merkel, Germans were very confident in their country and in their future. It's not that long ago. To what extent do you also think um, this might have to do with the change of leadership in the country, this mood swing? <clears throat> well, I think uh, Chancellor Scholz has the unlucky task to tackle some of the problems which actually were already visible under Chancellor Merkel. But now he has a job to more or less clean up the mess if you want to say so. Um, and then, of course, you have the war. You have uh, changing global market conditions. Um, so there are a number of factors, and I think they all, unfortunately, right now work against Germany. At the it moment. is certainly a perfect storm. We are going to have a look at the numbers, because while most industrialized nations are recovering strongly after the COVID-19 pandemic, the German economy is shrinking. Some politicians and economists are predicting Germany's downfall after decades of stability. What's more, that impression of weakness is damaging Germany's image. Germany is the fourth largest economy in the world. This export nation wants to become a climate neutral economy, but there is not enough investment. Companies are complaining about too much bureaucracy, slow digitalization and high taxes. More than 40% of companies lack skilled workers. But above all, energy costs are high, a consequence of years of dependence on Russian gas. Replacing it is expensive. One key industry is especially affected, the chemical sector. Sales are down and it is reducing production. Companies are now threatening to migrate, for example, to the US, which offers attractive subsidies. 
understand the German auto industry, fallen behind, electric cars have long been coming from China. Germany's economic growth is embarrassingly slow, according to the OECD. It ranks 19 among the 20 largest economies. It is followed by Argentina. But economists do expect a recovery in 2024, thanks to falling inflation and rising wages. How deep is the German economic crisis? And I'm going to toss that one to you, uh, Valerie. The German economy, as you already mentioned, was powerful thanks to cheap gas from Russia, but also very low military expenses and a thirst for German products coming from a booming China. All three are gone. Can it actually recover from this seemingly perfect storm? I think it would be too... Too, going too far to predict Germany's downfall like from a global player at this point. Um, I do think Germany can recover, but I think, as Anna said, you kind of have, you have so many issues that were long invisible because of growth, because of good conditions, because of money coming in. And since it's sort of been stripped to more of its like, bare bones, you kind of see what's actually going on in this like skeletal Germany and what structures have to be changed and fixed for the country to then prosper again in the future. And one of the most important aspects of uh, that outlook into the future is the energy transition. Anna, Germany is betting on an ambitious transition to renewable energies, but the resulting high prices uh, are actually driving companies away. Is there a reason to believe Germany is and will continue to be a competitive investment destination if this goes on? Um, I think the, the path Germany is on is, is a difficult one. It's a risky one. The problem is, I think, the people, the Germans, believed in this energy transition at the outset of this current government. And I think people have lost a bit the belief in it. Um, also because of some mistakes the government did. There were some laws which were not ideal uh, and made people more scared than necessary, maybe. I think... Uh, Still, on the long run, it will work. It is also necessary. Uh, but right now, we go through a, a valley of tears, I would say. What do you mean exactly when you say that people lost trust in that transition? Do you think they would say, bring back nuclear, bring back coal? Or what, what do you mean by that? I think, I think the, the, especially the Green Party, uh, has a problem here because the argument is always, we, we need to do this in order to save the world. And of course, then even people who are, who are not really into the details of the whole thing will understand that, you know, we, we do 2% of global CO2 emission, I think. We are responsible for 2%. So, of course, every sane person will ask him herself, well, okay, you know, it's 2%, but what do China do? What does the US do? Other countries in the world, India. Um, I mean, they, they all are big CO2 emitters. And the question is, of course, and it's a sort of valid question, why does Germany have to be like the ideal role model for everybody else? You mentioned the Green Party, Anna. It's one of three uh, governing parties in Germany right now. Katja, some blame government's uh, mixed signals for uh, the internal and the internal disputes that the government has for this general distrust in how they're dealing with the economy. Uh, why is it so difficult here to provide a much-needed clarity for the people? Well, I think partially it's the fact that you have a coalition government in Germany, which isn't necessarily the case in other countries such as, um, you know, the UK or, or the US. And so you're always going to have these internal negotiations and wranglings uh, coming into the public uh, sphere as well and giving the impression of a, you know, disjointed and, and disunited a government that isn't giving a, a clear course. I think the other issue is that even within the Green Party itself, um, you know, you've got arguments around the transition um, of the economy, particularly, you know, whether or how to substitute um, that part of the uh, part, part of the energy sector that can't be um, fully renewable energy uh, just yet. So, you know, what do you do to bring back nuclear, in which case the Green Party in particular in Germany has got a very strong legacy there of of opposition against it, but it would be 
uh, CO2, you know, friendlier than, than most of the other alternatives, which is why many green um, movements in other countries support it, but not in Germany, where that legacy is just there. Um, and at the same time, you know, people are arguing whether gas and in what, what form basically is, is the substitute, because at the moment, of course, it's incredibly expensive to import LNG. Um, so th there are all of these arguments, I think, internally, both within the parties and within a coalition government that give the impression of of a disjointed approach that isn't really uh, leading towards sort of clear goals or a clear vision. That's insecurity, which is, of course, toxic for the business environment. Now, Valerie, there's also another massive problem in Germany, or at least it's always mentioned, which is bureaucracy. There's this famous example of 45 five file folders required for one windmill. At least it was big in the news. Uh, is that that big a threat that it could harm the economy? I think it already is harming the economy. Um, I think that during during the era of Merkel, um, a lot of bureaucracy, the problem was there and it was known, but nothing really was done about it. So now we end up having these absolutely almost Kafka-esque structures in which people have to go back and back and back and, and get another permit, another permit. And of course, that makes investors more shy about investing because it's such a long drawn out process and i think i do feel that the the coalition now is trying to change that but it's also very hard again with the coalition government that katya already mentioned having different parties having the green party that historically has been very fond of environmentalism and now has to kind of give up like parts of that to uh, facilitate the transition to green energy. For example, if you put up a windmill, that might influence birds or, or something. That's like an example that's yeah. always given. And so basically, I think it already is part of the problem and it's something that they're trying to fix, but it's proven to be much harder to fix than was anticipated. The same goes for digitalization. Anna, there's talk that Germany is severely behind when it comes to that. What do you make of that assessment? Well, I just want to come back quickly to, to the bureaucracy problem. Of course, you have to ask the same political lead who, who introduced all this bureaucracy now <laughs> to remove it again. And it's always difficult because it, 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 it kind of undermines their own structure, which they themselves created. With digitalization, um, I think we all have made this experience, you know, you travel abroad, you know, to wherever in Europe you want to go and you suddenly, you realize, oh, wow, the Wi-Fi is much better here or the, the, the internet connection. Um, so there, there, there has to definitely, something has to happen here. But of course, again, we have then discussions about technical problems. For example, we discussed Huawei. And now we have this problem, okay, where you have to take out two away components from the network, probably, you know, which will even slow down the whole uh, process of, of en enlarging the, the internet structure, make it faster. So um, also here again, I think uh, we have, uh, the, the, how can I say, there is this feeling, okay, we have to do something about it. But then you have all the technical problems, really, and all the legal problems also. And, you know, data protection in Germany is a big issue. It, it is a huge problem for, for many digital um, uh, projects, actually, here. Yeah. You could say, summing it up, that it's always a battle between ideals and principles and the actual feasibility mm -hmm. of doing things. And when it comes to ideals, nothing is clearer as a problem than the society of Germany right now. It's not just the economic data. The German society is showing alarming trends. More and more people reject politics and the state and have less trust in democracy, not only in the eastern states that were under communist rule, but also in the West. Disappointment with politics is on the rise, posing a threat to what was once a given. The mood is dark in Germany. According to a survey, around 80% of Germans are worried about the future. Experts say this insecurity is the result of multiple crises, the corona pandemic, the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis and inflation. 
The German government has many disagreements. Most Germans think it is performing poorly. The FDP, SPD and Greens would no longer have a majority today. Even if a study shows that the coalition has initiated or implemented almost two-thirds of its promised legislation. The AFD, which is partly right-wing extremist, is benefiting from rampant discontent. In surveys, it ranks second across the nation and even first in eastern Germany. Extreme right-wing attitudes are becoming increasingly socially accepted. Over 8% of those surveyed in the Mitte study express a right-wing extremist worldview, and 20% are not clearly committed to democracy. Economic researchers are warning that should Germany move further to the right, investors will shy away. How can the growing right-wing populism be countered? Anna, how do you explain that the country that has always warned the rest of the world about forgetting the mistakes of the past is now giving far-right parties record support? Well, you know, it might sound a bit cynical, but again, we follow maybe the US example here. <laughs> I mean, you have you had like a pretty right-wing president in power. Uh, right now, you have a political crisis because you have uh, right-wing radicals basically questioning the whole democratic system. And of course, we see a similar trend in Germany. I mean, it's you know we have it in in a number of European countries. In Germany, of course, it always has a different meaning because of our historical past. But of course, uh, we are gripped by the same identity crisis, which I think many Western democracies face right now, um, before all of the US. Germany's history is certainly particular. Katja, the AFD, the far-right party, is strongest in the eastern part of the country, which used to be the German Democratic Republic, which was under communist rule. That appears to be a big contradiction. <laughs> yeah, it appears to be. Um, I think part, I, I partly agree with uh, Arne in that it's a uh, It's an international problem as well. So you see it in the US, but also in France with the with the Gilets Jaunes or in, in other countries as well, where there is disaffection and that, that often reflects in, in extremist um, politics. I think in East Germany in particular, there's another um, dimension there in that they can use this collective sense of, you know, we've gone through a different experience. We're not really feeling that this democracy that we're now part of is is sort of um working for the for the people and the afd is very very good at utilizing that so where people feel that you know those up there the, those kind of you know classical phrases that people use uh, are doing their own thing the afd sits in you know pubs and bars and in local uh, areas and, and organizes local events and people feel that they're being listened to by them i think that's that's one way in which this works um, and I think the other is that they are also very good at using this kind of logic or rhetoric that they're really perpetuating the peaceful revolution of 1989. So in contrast to many kind of popular opinions out there that, that sort of suspect that East Germans are nostalgic about the past, uh, actually the, the sort of uh, rhetoric that the AFD uses is, you know, you fought one dictatorship in, in 1989 and now the state's again trying to tell you what to do, so go onto the streets again. And, you know, they use slogans like for end the vendor, so like complete the, the peaceful yeah. revolution of, of 1989 and things like that. So I think that the difference is that there is kind of a in sort of like an in-group feeling amongst some East Germans that they feel, you know, they have their own identity and, and the AFD is better able to to play to that and to use that, I think, than, than elsewhere where it's difficult to kind of get a whole group of people to buy into the same thing. But do you think the current or the last governments have actually failed the people in East Germany or in the former East Germany? That's certainly how many people feel. Um, so, you know, take take like the infamous heating bill. You know, people were sort of saying that the government's trying to tell us how to heat our homes. Um, we're already struggling and there seems to be very little um, kind of communication towards trying to get people on board with this policy or explaining what it's actually for. You know, people were had the feeling that this is done to them. Um, so I think there's certainly a feeling out there that concerns aren't being heard or, you know, even when um, the, the refugee uh, crisis that is there at the moment, when, when communities or individual um, districts are being told 
they have to take so and so many refugees, but there isn't actually any kind of help or support, or that's how people feel anyway, in terms of housing people, supplying them, you know, finding kind of infrastructure that is there when, you know, schools, sports halls and things like that are being used. Um, people feel that this is directly impacting on their lives without them actually getting a say in it. We can't detach the AFD from a strong anti-migration discourse. Uh, Valerie, German companies, this comes all together with the economy as well, are complaining about a lack of skilled labor. We know that it can only be provided by foreigners. How racist is Germany and how much could that affect the economic outlook? I think as the country that was majority white for, or still is, um, for longest of its history, um, of course, there are is racism in Germany. Um, there's also, because I think of how conservative Germany was for a long time, there was also always sort of a rhetoric around, we're not actually an immigration country. This was actually something that was debated until like 10 or 15 years ago, where clearly Germany is an immigration nation, but hasn't identified as such for a long time. Um, I think, you know, studies show that Germans are open to, to immigration. And um, so I think it's, it's sort of twofold. I think, of course, there's racism, like, of course, but there's also, there was also an openness for a long time. And now with inflation, with the war, the crises, uh, the pandemic, all of these overlapping crises have sort of halted an, a, a sort of a, a positive excitement about um, immigration because now the way we talk about immigration right now is solely based on refugees entering the country, not as much people coming to work here. That would be a positive narrative because everyone knows you need people to work because there yes. are you know no people to work. <laughs> so um, So I feel like here, you kind of have to, you have to look at both subjects separately. So you have the refugees coming in needing help. Of course, a lot of them are traumatized. They've gone through terrible hardship. And on the other hand, the economy needs people to work. The question is, can you bring the two together? And that has not worked the way, especially members of the Green Party thought it would work out like initially in 2015. Um, so I think it also hasn't worked as badly, though, as some conservative pundits are saying. Like, I looked up the numbers today, and after six years of being here, 64% of people who, are, who were refugees do work. So there is, like, a positive trend, or after seven years, I think. There is a positive trend, but it's sort of not enough to keep um, a society that is already under stress um, positive about refugee immigration. It's certainly uh, a process for sure. Now, uh, we have a few more minutes left and I'd like to look into the future, which is always difficult. Anna, this has all, all been very grim, right? Looking into the future. How optimistic are you about the future of Germany and its role in the world as well? Well, I think we have proven in the past that we've been pretty good in handling crisis. Uh, I mean, at the end of the 90s, we also managed to get out of this sick man of Europe phase. And so I, I would hope that we are able to draw the necessary consequences. I think we need to maybe complain a bit less <laughs> and should maybe be a bit more optimistic about the future. That would already help. Um, and I think we, we would need a chancellor who's, who's not only you know, talking reality nice, but also addressing the problems, telling people what has to be done, and then just have to execute actually the, the, the necessary uh, measures which will be necessary to adopt to a rapidly changing world. A world that is certainly watching. Uh, Katja, do you think this, let's say, more humbled version of Germany could also be a good thing? Um, I, I'm also a bit cautious, you know, looking back as a historian, Germany has been has been declared at several times to be, 
you know, a, a stagnating economy, one that is slowing down. And it's always kind of like this big ocean liner, you know, of an economy that moves very slowly and it moves towards a crisis and it's difficult to turn around. But equally, it does move very slowly. And there's time, I think, to to sort things out. I think the problem is that um, quite often we, you know, we've, we've talked about some of these issues already. Um, kind of the ideal gets in the way of of actually looking at what needs to be done. And, and we end up basically with politicians arguing among themselves about the kind of ideal that they want and actually in reality the things that are necessary to to get close to it rather than directly to it um, and often along the way i think lots of people feel um literally left behind you know this phrase is often used as a cliche but it is it's is definitely an issue and we'll see how that unfolds in this ocean liner we at least we three here are thank you so much to all three guests thank you so much to you for watching remember you can always watch our youtube videos searching for dw news on youtube i'll see you next time take care and goodbye <laughs>